Hi everybody, it's Steve, aka our Dallas, and in this short video we're going to talk about our Dallas guard clauses, my popular NuGet package. If you want to learn more about guard clauses, please see my other video that talks about the pattern, not the package. And in this one, we're just going to jump right in and look at how the package can be used to make your code a little bit cleaner. So in this example, we have an appointment class. It has a user ID, a start, and an optional end date. We have some unit tests that kind of verify certain invariants are upheld. And you can see all these tests are currently passing. And they include things like the user ID must not be null or white space. Start date must be within a certain range. In this case, it can't be min value. The end date must follow the start date, and the end date cannot be a weekend. Now, to implement these, we have a service, and that's what the, the tests are testing is this service. And so the service's place in the application is to sit somewhere between the user interface and the domain model, and it's going to get called by the user interface whenever they want to create an appointment. Now, some of you are probably wondering, when should I do validation using a library like Fluent Validation or just the built-in model validation type? versus when should I use guard clauses, which are going to throw exceptions. The difference is that you want to do the model validation as close to the user input as possible. And then once you have validated it and you're calling into your service layer, whether that's a separate use cases layer or it's a domain service or an application service, at that point, your code should expect that the validation has taken place. And so if there are values that are out of range, that's an exception. That's an exceptional case because it should never get there because if you did your job right and you validated those inputs, you should have returned an invalid input result to the user rather than calling into this service with that bad data. So the difference is between validation and guard clauses is whether or not you're validating user input or whether or not you're in a state where you should already have trusted values coming into your service. In this case, I'm assuming that this service is gonna get called with trusted values and so anything that is out of range is a bug. It's going to be an exception. And so I'm going to do all my checks. And then if they pass, I'm going to return this new appointment here or possibly here if I didn't get an end date. All right. And so you can see this is a decent amount of logic to try and check all the things that could possibly go wrong. And that's what we're going to clean up by using guard clauses. The first thing we're going to do up here is guard against a uh, null or white space. And that'll get rid of the first check that we have with that if statement. Then we can check for out of range on the start date and Copilot's gonna help me out here. Next we can guard against an expression. And so reading this it says, it will return the input if the func evaluates to true. So it won't throw an, ex an exception if this expression is true. So when end date passes in and is greater than there, then, then we're good. Now this is gonna be a problem because end date is nullable. So we really want it to be end date dot value and then everything is good, but we're going to have to wrap that in an if check and say here, if end date is not null. All right. And then the other check we're going to do is the day of the week check. And again, Copilot's helping us out here. Okay. So now that we've added these guard clauses, the, again, the, the point of the pattern of guard clauses is that you want to fail fast. So do all your checks up front and then just rely on the happy path being what's left. So at this point, we can delete all our if conditions inside of this method and just return the created object. Start date must not be out of range. The range on this one, I forgot to update. Note that our out of range check, we wanna just make sure the start date is not min value. So we're just gonna add one to min value for that check and that'll be the lower bound of the range. If it comes in out of that range, it's gonna blow up, which is what we expect and you see now all our tests are passing. Okay, so this is certainly an improvement over what we had before, but look at this appointment class. It is not doing anything for encapsulation, right? And so because of these public setters, anywhere you would have an instance of this class, you would have to check it again to see if it was valid because you have no idea if someone has manipulated it in the meantime and, and made it invalid by setting one of these properties. So the way you can get that encapsulation and get that confidence in that class is to move these checks into its constructor so that it can be responsible for its own logic rather than delegating that out to some service. So what that looks like is pretty simple. We're just going to pull these, these guard clauses right here out of appointment uh, service and instead put them into a constructor. And if we're clever with how we name everything, everything will compile here in just a moment. 
And now you can see everything builds. The next step is just to fin finally assign those properties. And with that, we're gonna have one build error, which is how we're creating this appointment. We didn't have a constructor before. We were just doing object initialization. Now we're gonna pass in constructor arguments. And with that, all the tests pass once again. Notice that our create new appointment service isn't really doing a whole lot at this point. We might even be able to get rid of it if it's not doing additional logic. But we'll leave that for another decision for a later time. Let's go back and look at appointment because now that we've given it a constructor that can do all these checks, we still haven't given it encapsulation. Its properties are all still settable. So the next thing we'd wanna do is make these all private set if we could. And then we'd still wanna be able to give a way to update them, right? So, you know, maybe it would make sense for us to be able to change this appointment. So what would that look like? Well, if I want to change the end date, it might look something like this. And again, Copilot's helping me out a little bit. This code may not be exactly correct, but let's assume that it's close enough. Now, when I want to change the end date, I've got to check if it's not null. I've got to do all these guard checks and only then do I assign it. Now, the problem with this is that that's duplicating this code up here. Right, and so it would be nice if I didn't have that duplication. Now, one option would be to have my constructor call into this change end date method, but that is not a practice you want to follow. Uh, and if you have things in here that are doing other things, like you know maybe there's a event change domain event that gets fired, you don't want that getting triggered just by the constructor initializing the object. So generally, it's a bad idea to have your constructor calling out into methods like that, especially public methods. That's not the right approach. So the better thing to do would be to rely on objects again. And in this case, we're gonna create a new abstraction that represents the thing we're trying to validate here. And it's not just that end date is a thing that lives all by itself. This end date is not just a date time, it has some rules as a date range, as an appointment date range. And so we can create a new type that represents and encapsulates those rules. So now at this point, you can see we've got a date range type and we could put the validation checks inside of its constructor. So let's just go grab them from here and then just fix some of these names. All right now at this point, we have a proper type. It's all encapsulated. It has all of its logic checking inside of it. And we can just use this type instead on our appointment. So coming up here to appointment, we have a couple of different choices. We could still have this constructor pass in these date times, or we could have the constructor pass in the date range, which is even better. But for now, we'll leave it that it's just a date range and it has a date range. Now, what this is doing is it's delegating the validation checks into that other type and it will do that work. And what that means is that when I go to change the end date here, I can still support this but instead of having to do a duplicate check here with the same logic, now I can just say, and then say that my new date range is being assigned to the date range property. Now, because these are exceptions that are gonna get thrown, if there's any problem, we can actually just inline all this and make it one step. Now you might argue at that point, whether it makes sense just to make the setter public, that depends. What this is letting us do by having an explicit method for it is giving us a hook where we could also do things like raising domain events or things like that. Now, with these in place and using this date range struct, we can go ahead and, and run our tests. And you can see everything still passes. The last couple things that I want to hit before we're done with this video is a couple simple things to make your life easier. Notice that we've got two lines of code here, one to guard against the input and one to assign it. Because all of these guard clauses return the input if it's valid, you can do that in one line. Also, as of C-sharp 10, there is a new attribute called caller argument expression, and I'm using that inside the library so you don't actually need to specify the name of the type that's gonna be pulled in for you. So at that point, things get a little bit simpler still. Same thing down here. If you're checking to see whether or not the start date is out of range and then you're gonna assign it, there's no reason why you can't assign it all in one line. The one last thing I wanna show you is uh, a check that we're doing here for weekends, right here, guard against expression of the weekends. It's really easy for you to pull this out into its own custom guard clause. And so instead of having an, an expression that you might get wrong, once you've got it right, you can reuse that thing by just giving it a, a, a nice name. So you can say guard against dot weekend dates for end date dot value. 
and you're done. So what does that look like? Well, you can just create an extension method and extend from guard clause, this I guard clause type, call it whatever you want, pass in whatever type it expects, and then do your checks inside of here. And now this extension method is available anywhere that you're using guard clauses, assuming that you use the same namespace, or if you'd rather be in your own custom namespace, then obviously you just need to pull that namespace in in order to use it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If so, please like and hit subscribe. If you have any questions or ideas for new topics, please leave me a comment below. Thanks.